would it be like in a world without countries? How would we think about blocks of land without borders and country names to refer to them? And what language would we use to identify ourselves? If you're not Irish or German, what are you? Nationhood might seem like a natural way to organise the world. After all, more and more people seem to want their own state. South Sudan became the world's newest country in 2013. And last year, Scotland went to the polls to decide if they wanted independence. But are states the best way to run the world? Or is there an alternative? We spoke to a number of people to find out what they think. I can't speak to the fact of whether nations will exist forevermore, but the capacity to band will always be with us. Gad Saad is a professor of marketing and an evolutionary behavioural scientist at Concordia University in Canada. As Gad explains it, nations are new. They only started to emerge at the end of the 19th century. In the past, we lived in family groups of hunter-gatherers, and those groups rarely went beyond a particular size. There's a, uh, a theory by a uh, British anthropologist by the name of Robin Dunbar, who argued that uh, humans have evolved in bands that are no greater than about 150 people. And so this has become known colloquially now as Dunbar's number of 150. And so for much of our evolutionary history, uh, our in-group is really our kin, our immediate kin, our extended kin, and perhaps a few other close allies. It's also interesting to note that Dunbar's number of 150 also represents the average number of friends a person has on Facebook. But as humans became farmers and settled in villages and larger groups, they had to work out a way to deal with more than Dunbar's number of 150 people. They did this by developing hierarchies. They became loyal to chieftains or people in power, who themselves managed small groups, and eventually these societies and hierarchies grew and became more complex. And then we had a variety of other forms of uh, social organisations, such as city-states, city leagues, confederacies, tribal confederacies, kingdoms, and mostly empires as well. Sinisha Malesevic is professor of sociology in UCD. All of these were kind of very different from nations in a sense that there was no attempt to forge cultural and political unity. We had ethnic groups, we had uh, ethnic categories and all sorts of other forms of identity, but they were much smaller than nations and most of them did not aspire to have a state or any kind of a political roof. But all that changed around the late 18th century. With the Industrial Revolution, many people left behind those small groups and moved to cities to work. And once you move from that small local community into a big city in search for work, you have to develop a much wider sense of identification and you also have to use language, which is a standardised language. But this wasn't enough to make a nation. At the beginning of the 19th century in France, for example, very few people actually felt French. A hundred years later, though, everyone felt French. And that's because the country manufactured a national identity based on language and culture. In other words, it branded itself. When a country goes through the independence process, goes through decolonization, there's a lot of room to move, room to maneuver and room to basically define the country. Robert Saunders is Professor of Political Science at Farmingdale State College in New York. Looking particularly at the case of Ireland, there has been a sort of very long trajectory in teaching the world about Ireland, and certainly a lot of that was done through the diaspora around the world. I mean, there's famously, Ireland has many more Irish living outside of Ireland than inside it. And that's how we got one of our most Irish of traditions. That isn't Irish at all. The St. Patrick's Day Parade. The first ever parade was staged in America by Irish expatriates. At the time, the Irish were positioned very low on the social hierarchy. And the aim of the parade was to send out a strong message that the Irish were organised and a force to be reckoned with. But at the beginning of the 20th century, we also branded ourselves as a Catholic country. And according to Sinisha Milisevic, this was a reaction to colonisation. Uh, most nationalist movements particularly the independence-oriented nationalist movements, tend to define themselves religiously in opposition to the empire. So you had that, let's say, in, in the Balkans, where the Orthodox Christians relied on religion to emphasize their Greekness or their Serbianness vis-à-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire. So because Britain became Protestant, Ireland chose not to. 
So when you put it all together like this, it almost seems that national identities tend to be fake or manufactured. Oh, I, I, I think they're all manufactured, but they only manufacture themselves successfully if they draw on native material which is already available. Diana Muir Applebaum is a historian and writer. And according to her, a strong identity can build a solid nation of people who have very little in common. She cites India as a good example. She says it had a lot to do with Nehru, the country's first prime minister, and a book he wrote called The Discovery of India. Which swept the Indian intellectual classes in the years when he wrote it, which was pre-independence. And it was a book arguing that India was an eternal and ancient nation, that there were important values that they all shared, and that India was a old and valid nation in the same way that you know China or France or Persia are. This was all hokum, of course. He stitched this together from a marvelous pastiche of cherry-picked quotations and examples. It wasn't true. But people believed it. And because they believed it, it unified a country of disparate peoples. But, says Diana, nationhood may have given people even more than just unity. When we have that level of shared culture and trust, it becomes possible to have democracy. But as well as being a force for good, according to Neil O'Doherty, nationhood can bring its own problems. Neil is a senior lecturer in the School of Political Science and Sociology in NUI Galway. One of the difficulties with nationhood is it, it, it's based on a clear distinction between those who belong and those who don't belong. So at, at its heart is not only community and coming together, but exclusion. And this creates great difficulties. Uh, the most extreme version, obviously, was in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, national socialist ideology in Germany, fascism in Italy, a version of the nation that was ultimately genocidal, that, that aspired to wipe out all those who didn't belong to a particular version of the nation. But belonging to a nation doesn't always mean people feel connected. According to Gad Saad, if nationhood is imposed rather than embraced in the way it was embraced in India, that nation mightn't last. For example, Iraq, you know, many people argue that the only reason why Iraq was able to stand for so long is that because it had a very strong, you know, dictator who could, you know, hold all the different, different ethnic and religious fighting in check. Once Saddam Hussein was removed, well, we see now exactly the situation where you've got the Kurds that wish to define themselves as being different from the Sunnis, different from the Shias. So I think that if in reality my ethnic or religious identity is more powerful than my allegiance to the nation, then you'll have fracturing. And the way to avoid these fractures, Gad says, is to ask people from diverse backgrounds to assimilate into the nation. Failing to do that, he says, is a dangerous proposition. Because then what you end up getting is uh, ghettos where cultural values are not necessarily shared across these different groups. Although the creation of countries and states has been more or less positive, they provided security, self-determination and an incentive not to go to war, people like Martin van Creyfeld have written about how nations are becoming less relevant or even shaky. There are many reasons for this, he says, like globalisation or mass immigration without assimilation. He feels the heavy bureaucracies that helped consolidate people and build nations are no longer working properly. That governments in many countries are unable to solve local problems or even global conflicts. But for all the issues associated with the state, and we know the concept is not perfect for many reasons that are too complex to go into here, is it, as we asked at the beginning of the programme, the most natural way to govern ourselves? Or, in the words of John Lennon, can we imagine there's no countries? I have no problem with countries in the sense of people having an affection for their language, culture, local ways of life. But countries in the sense of a nation state, I see no need for it. Kevin is a social and political theorist, and he believes it's more natural to govern ourselves in smaller groups, which in a way chimes with Dunbar's number that was mentioned at the start of the programme. 
That's a theory that humans evolved to work best in groups of 150 people. There's no technological reason for most large-scale economic production. The majority of the things we consume could be produced with small-scale decentralized technology serving neighborhood or community-sized markets. Um, the stuff that actually requires organization on a larger territorial scale is a relatively small portion of the total stuff that goes on. I mean, you, you would need some sort of uh, cooperation over larger areas to maintain uh, railroad lines or uh, light commuter rail between local communities and that sort of thing. I can't speak to the fact of whether nations will exist forevermore, but the capacity to band will always be with us. So the Yanomomo tribe in the Amazon may not have what you and I define as nation states, but they clearly have demarcations between their band and some other band around the corner in the forest. So I think that element of coalitional thinking will always be with us. I think the vision of a world that transcends power is certainly an unrealistic vision. So power will always be there. Boundaries and control of space will always be an important source of power. And the nation state just happens to be the prime form that that territorial power takes at the moment. But if you got rid of the nation state, you would still have territorial power, perhaps associated with a different, different set of ideas. It would be nice to have a much softer sense of borders. Before modernity, borders were very soft in a sense. You did need passports to go from one place to another. And now nation states have become so strong, so you know, they police their borders very strictly. So in that sense, it would be easier for us, better to live in a world which isn't as policed in that sense as it, you know, what we had before. <laughs>